Hey everybody and welcome to episode 49 of the Reviver Cell Podcast. Here we go. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Have you got a health issue that just won't go away no matter what you try? Then welcome to the Revive Yourself Podcast, where we reveal the secrets to long-lasting health by getting to the root cause of problems that no one else is talking about. So you can have more energy, clear skin, healthier hair, a leaner physique, more confidence, and most importantly, do the things you love and live the life you deserve. Here's your host, Ryan Martin. So guys, welcome to episode 49 of the Revive Yourself podcast. Um, Just before we get into today's show, I just want to say um, well done to all of you guys that are going through the free four-day mini course. You're all doing really well. And any of you that have got a chronic issue, then head on over to www.reviveyourself.co and you can enter the free four-day gut revival mini course for free. Anyway, with chronic issues, it's going to be really good for you. So enjoy that. Right, so on to today's episode, and so it's a controversial one with Dr. Terry Tillard, and it's all about how to reverse type 1 diabetes. Now, I put a post out um, from Saturday talking about how we're going to go into this, and got a lot of love, and I also got a lot of hate, and I don't mind the hate, because um, if me getting abused a little bit, and being told that I'm Ill, I'm, I'm an idiot, and my audience is an idiot, etc., um means that i'll take that abuse if it means that getting the right information out to people so they can help heal themselves so that's to live in pain and frustration anymore then that's what i'll do and i think it's really important you know i know that the uh, this message of natural health and healing um lots of people are going to be um triggered by it especially when they've lived with type 1 diabetes for a long period of time and finding out they hadn't they didn't have to inject themselves with insulin it's going to be quite um, a shock to the system uh, an eye opening um, and as I said before I've got no agenda here guys I just want to help people and get them as healthy as possible same as Terry so I would say before we get into this that this isn't we aren't medical doctors so we, we don't give you medical advice um, and it, before you do anything I would um, work with a health professional first the case is not um saying go and do these things straight away or stop taking medication no we don't ever do that we have to cover ourselves so i'm just saying if it was us this is what we would do um and yeah to give you the 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 the, uh, the responsibility of working with someone who knows what they've they, they're doing and done it before so that being said this is a brilliant interview with terry and we go deep into type 1 diabetes um and how to reverse it so here he is, here's the main man, um, enjoy, and I'll see you on the other side. And welcome to episode 49 of the Viber Show podcast today. I think, um, yeah, it's your third time on. We've got Terry Tinner back on the show for his third appearance with us. So, how are you going, Terry, today? I'm doing great, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Love doing shows with you. So, you know, three three is too little. We'll keep them rolling. Yeah, we will, mate. We definitely will. It's, uh, Terry, Terry is amongst my favorite um, Facebook sort of uh, truth tellers out there uh, as me here of course quite a few of us out there but someone I've got to, to know and like a lot it's great having him on the show um, and today's topic we'll be talking about is diabetes but particularly type 1 diabetes because it's something that I mean a lot that nowadays we get a lot of talk just going around with like gut health we, um, there's a lot of I was talking food produce etc lots of things get talked about but type 1 diabetes is something that doesn't get that much airtime, probably because people think it's a lifelong um, it was genetic illness it's, and it's lifelong. In fact, I went onto the NHS website, uh, which is our National Health Service or No Health Service, whichever one you prefer, um, and it says their overview of diabetes type 1 is um, it's a lifelong condition um, that causes a person's blood sugar to become too high. Type 1 is where the pancreas doesn't produce any insulin and there's no coming back from it, basically. And the, and the symptoms are feeling very thirsty, passing urine more often than usual, particularly at night, feeling very tired, weight loss, and a loss of, uh, of muscle bulk. So this, the reason I've got Terry on is because uh, one of my friends recently got diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and uh, Terry had done a video on it. And it was it was really interesting to hear him put to bed all of the, the nonsense that usually gets spouts, spouted about it. So, um, Terry, 
is type 1 diabetes a lifelong genetic uh, um, condition that you can't get rid of? Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me on the call again, Ryan. And let's start by clarifying a few things. Number one, all truth passes through three stages. First is ridiculed. Second is violently opposed. <clears throat> and third, it becomes self-evident. I always encourage people to finally think about taking responsibility for their reaction to somebody's message. Um, you know, I, we always say talk about responsibility. It should be spelled response dash ability. We have the ability to respond to any information in the way that we want. And if we're taking responsibility for our role in any conversation, whether it's a one way or two way dialogue, we realize that, hey, wait a second, maybe just because somebody said something that doesn't sit well with me, maybe the messenger is not the problem. Maybe the listener is the problem. Maybe the programming of the listener is indeed the problem. Because if we look at all autoimmune disorders, every single one known in history, they're, they're all reversible. They've all been reversed. The, the, the silly notion that type 1 diabetes would be the only one that's special in some way that wouldn't do it is mind-boggling to me. The idea that such a critical organ like the pancreas would simply stop working for no good reason whatsoever doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever for anyone stopping to think about it. The fact that some people get it in their first decade of life, while some people can get it in their ninth decade of life, is great proof that it's not genetic. That, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That you can go into your 90th decade of life before showing a single sign or symptom. Was there a gene just lying dormant somewhere in your body that decided on your 90th birthday it's going to attack you for no good reason and no good reason whatsoever? That, uh, that doesn't make any sense. One of the things I like to look at, you know, when, it's, when we talk about cancer, when we talk about other diseases, I think some of the best studies in the world for those who want to make genetic claims are looking at what happens with twins. You know, the single largest uh, study ever done on cancer and twins showed that, uh, that genetics played such a tiny role that it was basically non-existent. And for whatever genetic predisposition somebody had, these twins had absolute control over it. So in most cases, one twin led a very different lifestyle, and that's why they got cancer. Well, what happens? What about type 1 diabetes? Has anyone ever looked at the relationship between twins and type 1 diabetes? The answer is, of course. And it ranges somewhere between 10 and 50 percent. So much like blackjack in Vegas, 50-50 are the odds. But they're not, the, you know, 50-50 is not the odds. What happened with two different twins is they clearly led different lifestyles. When we look closer at type 1 diabetes research, and I'll stop in a minute to give it pause, we find out that it happens at different parts of the world at very different rates. It happens at different parts in relation to distance from the equator. It depends on what month you were born in. The, the diagnosis rates for prevalence for when diabetes is diagnosed happens in certain months of the year. I mean, there's just way too many patterns to call anything a coincidence or to call it random or to call it genetic. Yeah, uh, it's... Yeah, when you go into that, we'll go, go, we'll go into, into that in, in a bit, which is really, really important. Well, this is the thing, because people think that type 1 diabetes is generally something that people are born with, right? It's, um, and which, is, which comes to the point, well, why, why would that happen? Where's that coming from? Is it just bad luck? Hmm. Or is it come down to percentage of being brought on by toxic parents? What's been going on there? Um, because generally people, but this is <laughs> for so long. People say, "Oh yeah, it's 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 irreversible. It's it's a genetic condition. It's born. You're born with it." So if if that is true, how come more and more people are now getting diagnosed with it in their twenties, thirties, forties, fifties? So I mean, what what do you think about that? Well, you know, people have to start asking these questions, and the moment your mind is really open to the facts I just shared and the questions you just posed. You have to call everything into question. You know, I always say where there's smoke, there's fire. You know, if you've caught the establishment lying to you hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of times about every subject you can name to assume that this one particular lie is not one of them is patently ridiculous. Um, that doesn't make any sense. They've lied to us about all kinds of things. They tell you cancer is not curable. They tell you type, di type 2 diabetes is not reversible. They tell you you're stuck with, well, basically every disease that you need their drugs for life. If you've got a cholesterol problem, they tell you that you need cholesterol medication. 
they don't say you need cholesterol medication for about 87 days and then you're off of it. Well, if the drugs worked, of course, you'd be getting off of it. They basically have you on a plan for the drugs for life. And this happens all the time. So why would they be not lying to you in type one? I don't know. Here's another question for you. You talked about the diagnosis prevalence. I'm going to turn off my Facebook here so there's no beeping in the background. Um, for, you talked about diagnosis prevalence changing, now growing in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s. Well, the human genetic code most certainly isn't changing in one decade over another. But here's another question. Why are the diabetes rates, type 1 diabetes rates, almost non-existent in certain countries? In fact, some of the largest countries of the world, I don't recall precisely exactly which ones, but I believe China and India were two of the lowest. If I recall properly, I, I, if you want to see those exact stats, you can go see one of my videos I've done. I detailed that research. But if you, we're talking about billions of people. We're now talking about one third of the planet that has a predisposition for diabetes being almost non-existent. And then you go to countries like Finland, uh, who I believe is the single largest dairy consumption country of the world, and they've got a, a predisposition or a likelihood of getting type 1 diabetes that is, I don't know, something like 50 times greater than India, which is really not that much farther away, geographically speaking. That doesn't make any sense. There's not different genes in India than there is in China. For those who are thinking, well, maybe there is. Well, when we look at breast cancer predisposition as another scientific example, women who live in China, if I recall right, it's been years since I read the study, but I think we're like 117th the likelihood of getting breast cancer in China. But those same women, when they move to the U.S. and adopt the North American lifestyle, a.k.a. a cancer-promoting lifestyle, their disease level evens right off completely with North Americans. Why would diabetes be different? And of course it's not. Yeah, epigenetics, environment over the genome, huge. Um, just for people out there, what is – right, actually, you know what? First of all, I'm just going to put some stats out there. This is, this, is all, this is all diabetes. In fact, I've just seen in the UK um, 4 million people living with diabetes in the UK um, present. Wow. Um, Four million, yeah. One in every sixteen having diabetes. You know, in in America now, it's something like um, a third of the population is, is diabetic or pre-diabetic. Yeah, uh, Chris Cressa did say on this the other day in one of his podcasts, and he said this is this is the thing that the biggest threat to America and even to our uh, economy is is diabetes is, is chronic illness because you look at this, okay. It costs on average fourteen thousand dollars or fourteen thousand pounds to deal with someone every year with diabetes. Okay, so someone gets diagnosed in their forties and they live till they're eighty-five. Um, I think it's fourteen times forty or forty-five, whatever it is, works out six hundred thirty thousand pounds or six hundred thirty thousand dollars a person. Now, with a third of the population being diabetes or pre-diabetic, and if you're pre-diabetic, within about, they say, within about a year or two, you're going to have diabetes, because most people don't understand it. Instead of paying someone like myself, or you, as an insurance company, 10000 or £5,000 to deal with these people, the insurance companies go, no, yeah, you're laughing, because what that, that's just too common sense. Instead of doing that, what we'll do is we'll pay £14,000 every year to give them insulin or whatever medication no one's ever been born with a me um, medication deficiency just to get out there but they'll spend fourteen thousand pounds a year to do this the rest of their life which equals about six hundred thirty thousand pounds or dollars where when you look at it that is not economically sustainable it's going to cripple us and until they do something about it it's going to be a big problem now um it's saying that people those stats are just astronomical and that's just diabetes without anything else you know um so this is why people are like so yourself and though people, the more and more people are getting to understand that chronic illness, when it comes to it, the medical industry hasn't really got a clue. A and E put you back together from a car crash, phenomenal. Chronic illness hasn't got a clue. But there's the people out there. The difference between type one and type two diabetes. What is it, Terry? Um, I know because people can think that type two diabetes, you can develop it later in life when your pancreas stops producing insulin, etc. But why? What is the difference between type one and type two? Well. A lot of people like to focus on those differences the same way people like to focus on the, the perceived differences of their cancer diagnosis. Everyone is conditioned in our society to believe that their disease, their ailment is in some way special, extra special. And of course, the extra special uh, you know, relaying from the doctors is a part of their sales pitch. 
you know, the more rare, unique, blah, 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 special you think your cancer is, the more dependent you are on some expert. You know, the more that you words. need their experts with big, yeah, big words, big words, and you need their tailored approach and you need their specialty drugs and you need the and by the way, it's great bragging rights. The greatest addiction on the planet is big problems, not small problems, but really big problems. The greatest addiction on the planet. So they love to feed into that. You, you know, people brag about their diseases all the time. Type 1 diabetes, no different than the cancer situation. They love to brag. So what are the differences? Well, not that much. We're still talking about the pancreas. We're still talking about blood sugar regulation. We're still talking about imbalance. We're still talking about toxicity. We're still talking about deficiencies. We're still talking about the body being out of balance. What is going on in that situation? Why is the pancreas? Why can the body not control its blood sugar? At the end of the day, it's still about controlling blood sugar any way that you slice it. Now, there are some differences. They believe type 1 is more autoimmune related. Well, that's okay. We talked, we started the show talking about how all autoimmune illnesses are reversible, meaning that they can be healed from. There's no cure, there's no magic pill, but they can be reversed and healed from. Personally, Kerry, I don't really believe in autoimmune conditions. In terms of, I don't ever think the body ever is going to attack itself. It's attacking something, but I don't think the body's ever, it's too intelligent to ever attack itself. So the whole thing for me, I'm always like, who's saying all immune? I'm going, yeah, you've got a condition. But this whole immune thing to me, it's just like, the body's not stupid. It doesn't, it, and as you say, like, so the question that when I asked Adam, and that's why I just, just to pass that, I, I do understand there's different diseases out there, they're labeled autoimmune, you definitely can have problems, and they say your body's reacting to it. But just for me, autoimmune, the whole thing, I'm just like, yeah, I think the body's much more intelligent than that. But um, Adam, I said to Adam, because one of our friends, that, uh, one of my friends that actually got type 1 diabetes, and I said to him, look, I'm going to get Terry on the show, Ed. So let's ask him all the questions that, because I know he's been to, to the hospital, he's seen the doctors, and they've told him that, et cetera, et cetera, what he's got to do, and they're giving them medication, and what he's doing, injecting insulin, et cetera. And I said, look, just give me some questions that we can ask Terry, because the other day, I want you to listen to it. I want you to get. I want you to get better. Either way, but one of the questions you said is, why is it medically accepted that you can reverse type two but not type one? There's loads of research projects attempting to do it, but currently no breakthrough. He said basically, and he's he's he sort of got some sort of answer. It revolves around the beta cells dying out um, in this two year honeymoon period. Um, and for example, um, he said he's in that honeymoon period at the moment. Um, and it's a minute honeymoon period, and uh, he was injecting four units at, at breakfast, six at lunch, six, eight at dinner, so 16 units overall. Now he's only injecting um, eight background units, none at breakfast, none at lunch, none at dinner. So, I mean, does this make sense to you, or is it just all a load of smoke and mirrors? Well, it's a very loaded question. You know, complex situations, I always believe people should work with an expert. And I don't define expert as someone who's a drug dealer um, because no one's ever improved their health with a drug dealer in the history of the planet. But working with someone who understands what where disease really comes from, and I spell disease always with dis-ease. So when we talk about the beta cells, let's just focus in on that quickly. The doctor may not have read research that there are substances that regenerate beta cell production, but that doesn't mean that beta cell reproduction can't happen. That just means that the doctor hasn't read it, period. That just simply means that there's no drug that you can inject or ingest that is going to regenerate your beta cells. That's not going to happen because no human in the history of the planet has ever improved their health with poison. It's never happened. It's never going to change. The idea – the doctor is only legally allowed to offer you poison. I'm good friends with some doctors. They're very busy people, very nice people. They make a fantastic income, and when they leave that office, all they want to do is lead a fun, enjoyable personal life. They do not go home and read medical journals. The only medical journals and studies they are reading are the ones that the pharmaceutical companies are spoon-feeding them, period, end of story. I've never met a medical doctor that, where that story wasn't true. But there are lots of things that can regenerate beta cells. So let's put that part to rest. Are any of them going to act as a simple magic pill or a magic supplement that you're going to take? That's complete delusion. That's not going to happen. You're not just going to go home and take one magic pill of any kind, whether it came from nature or a lab, and get healthy and get well. You know, when someone has type 1 diabetes, 
when someone has type 2 diabetes, when someone has Crohn's, when someone has cancer, when someone has AIDS, when someone has fill in the blank, when they have heart problems, congestive heart failure, the first thing I want to do with them always, because A, it's prudent, B, it's the legal, le- legally right thing, it's the morally right thing, it's the health appropriate right thing, is to get a proper health history on them to figure out what's really gone wrong, what kind of imbalances do they really have, what tests might we run that might make sense. Standard blood tests don't tell us much of anything. Imaging scans aren't going to tell us much of anything, but there are specific tests we can go run to see what is really gone wrong with this person? What environmental exposures have they come across throughout their lifetime that may have set this trigger off? What lifestyle factors were they leading that didn't that that equated to this? So if the highest dairy consumption countries in the world are the ones getting the most diabetes, we're just taking one risk factor here. We're obviously not accounting for all of them. But if we just look at one, you introduced me to someone who's got type 1 diabetes that wasn't consuming any dairy. I haven't met them yet. I haven't heard of them yet. Haven't met them yet. So if we can identify even one risk factor, one risk factor, we can also, we can no longer state that it was a random event. We can no longer state that it was an irreversible event. We've now found very clear, identifiable risk factors. Are there certain vaccinations that have been linked to these issues? Absolutely, they are. Let's go find out if they've done it. So if there are lots of risk factors that have been documented to contribute, we need to deal with all of them. Not just say, what's this beta cell regeneration thing you talked about? No, sk- skip that thinking. You'll get, you'll get to that as a part of an overall plan. Let's first go see what other risk factors we can control and which other ones you've already been exposed to in the past that we can correct and rebalance. See, disease is all about imbalance. You're not going to take a magic pill. It's going to correct. So if your body has hundreds of different systems, let's just suppose your body has hundreds of different systems that are all working together. There's no one pill that's going to correct every system in the body. That's not going to happen. And so for me, it's about looking at those things. But never mind this business of there's no such thing as beta cell regeneration. That's complete bullshit. I've seen dozens of studies of of substances that have been shown to do that. Are they all going to restore 100% beta cell function in one day, one time by taking one magic pill? That's not going to happen. That, that's, that's unfortunately the delusion that our society has been programmed with since birth, that for every disease, there is no real etiology. There only is one magic pill as an antidote. And so long as we find the right magic pill as an antidote to every disease, that it'll fix itself. It's complete hogwash. It, that, that's not how health works. It never has. That's like saying you can only exercise and do nothing else right and still be healthy. We've seen people try and do that. World famous bodybuilders have died at 50 years old by leading garbage lifestyles, but they hit the gym. Great. But they still died because you can't just the health is not one component. Yeah. And there's a lot of difference between looking good. uh, So you can look good and and not be healthy. But generally, when when you're healthy, you're going to look good and then you're going to feel good. And this is this is. People say, oh, wait, I get loads of messages. Ryan, what do you think about this herb? What do you think about this protocol? And I'm like, brilliant. You're just chucking magic bullets in or magic pills in. It's never going to work. It never has, you know. Oh, what? So you're not getting, a, you're not sleeping properly. You're not doing enough exercise. You're not eating organic food. You're doing this, 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 this wrong. But you're going to take, I don't know, for example, turmeric and think it's sure. going to cure your life. No. It all works in conjunction with anything else, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Perfectly said. Yeah, and um, so so this is the thing. So when it comes down to it, um, type type one diabetes is no different to any of the other things in terms of you're going to have to look at the bigger picture, and this is this is the huge thing. So just quickly, well, it's what you said there about the drugs. Drugs are, as you said, the cholesterol and things like statins. Statins actually increase the risk of diabetes as well. Wonder why that is. Is that to do with destroying the pancreas? I don't know. I'm going to, give, going to give it a big guess, a big tick, so yeah, probably, um, amongst other things that they're horrifically dangerous for. Um, but it's, um, it's like with these drugs, as you say, when they put you on drugs, you never, I know people have had type 1 diabetes all their life and always taking insulin. They never have less insulin, they always have more. I know some of other people go to the doctors for one medication. They never come off that medication, they go on a harder one. And it's never, yeah, and it's never... There's, there's no, there's no, there's nowhere off the, the train, you know. Until people actually start taking care of their own lives and looking at what health actually means, because people don't understand. Your body wants to be healthy. Its default setting is health. You didn't get these things yeah. until you were older. It's Absolutely. the things that we do to to ourselves that fuck our body up, 
And it's just amazing that you can deal with it so much. And as you said, you know, you go to these these tribes, um, they don't even have words like the Inuits or whatever else. Um, they don't even have words for cancer or diabetes. Right. They never had them. Um, as I say, unless you're going to go and see the, the animals at the zoo or the pets that have been fed by people feeding the pet food, complete garbage. I'll, I'll, that's, another, that's, a, that's another topic I want to go into. But if you go out in the wild, you're never going to see a rattlesnake with diabetes. You know? No, never. Oh, yeah. it's absolutely never. It's not a chance. Or a giraffe with Alzheimer's. You know, it's just not going to happen. This, right. these, are, these are things. So when it comes to diabetes, um, type one diabetes, and they say that they 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 haven't been able to reverse it. Have you yourself worked with people? Just this is good. Have you yourself worked with people that you've been able to type, reverse type one diabetes with? Well, a few different questions. Number one. First, if one person in history has done it someplace, sometime, anywhere, that's evidence that it can be done, period. Why not you? Why not now is my first question to people. Secondly, why does everyone think that cancer and diabetes and heart disease and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and all these problems are wildly different? Sure, they have some differences, but it's all about health or not health at the end of the day. And unfortunately, people with type 1 diabetes would rather just curse anybody out and have a a hate speech match and start threads in diabetes groups about one person who gave them hope rather than actually take responsibility and do anything. They bought into the story hook, line, and sinker, and they don't want to hear anything else about it. What we found was there are people who I can work with them and get their blood sugar in very quick control, very quickly with no drugs. And this has also been done in research and clinical settings. In fact, there was a study done uh, with type one diabetics where they got them off of all of the drugs and within 72 hours normalized 50% of all the type one diabetics in 72 hours in a clinical setting, period. So never mind about, well, yeah, but did you, listen, I've talked to some type 1 diabetics. I've helped them improve their numbers, improve their scores. Unfortunately, a lot of them are children. And the discipline factor of getting the children to, to fully get on board has been the single largest issue. Now, that doesn't mean that what I'm teaching doesn't work. That doesn't mean that what they're doing in the research studies doesn't work. Of course it works. Does it work for everyone? Of course it works for everyone. Your digestive anatomy is identical to every other human on the planet, period. So the same puzzle pieces that fit in your stomach fit in somebody else's stomach. That's just the way that that ball bounces. Uh, With type 2 diabetics, I brought their diabetes down 155 points in 15 hours. I mean, you, Diabetes. You, you mean, sorry, to, to say that you saw my p- picture the other day, right, with one of my clients who was at like 19.9. And we got him down to, in one day, of eating him correctly. I think it was in, you, I think you, I think you even mentioned to me or you liked it. And I was like, that, that just shows you that it can be done, right? And you said. Right. As, it, we're talking yeah. in one day. We're talking yeah. in one weekend. Yeah. One you weekend. know, so, so, so if I could get you to be perfectly disciplined for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, Okay, and we also dealt not just diet, but we also dealt with a lot of the other issues. Imagine what we could do then in that case. I mean, there was a documentary years ago of a guy who reversed his type one diabetes in 30 days. So fuck this noise about people saying it can't be done. It got done in 30 days in a documentary where they filmed the entire process like get out. of You may not have met the person. Your doctor may not have met the person. Does that mean that it can't be done? Did a tree fall in the forest today? At, just because you didn't witness it, I mean, you didn't witness it. Doesn't mean it didn't fall. It still fell. I mean, yeah. it it happens. And type one or type two. Yes, I will respect that there are some very real differences between the two, but they're narrow. They're not like an ocean apart. They're narrow. And if you can, if it's all about controlling blood sugar and it can be done in seventy two hours, then that tells you everything that you need to know that it's that there's hope. And here's my question to those who want to play the skeptic and think, well, if you personally can introduce me to 103 people, then I'll decide I'm going to discipline. But until you introduce me to 103 people personally that I can shake their hands and meet their grandmother, then there's no way I'm going to buy into the idea that my diabetes might be reversible. That that's a cop out. That's people making up stories. That's hiding. That's hiding from the from from discipline. But here's my question to you. What do you have to lose? 
if you could cut your insulin in half in a weekend and you're not doing it, you're hiding, plain and simple. That's cowardice of some kind. You can call it whatever you want. You're either addicted to giving up your story and all the emotional rewards that come with having the big problem and the big league diagnosis, or <laughs> you're scared shitless of discipline, but the lack of discipline is what got you into the situation in the first place. So you can't say discipline won't work. You've never tried it. Or you wouldn't be in this situation because nobody who lived a properly disciplined lifestyle and had the correct distinctions ever gets type 1 diabetes. So my question to you is if you can cut the drugs in half and you can cut all the insulin in half in 30 days, why would that not be a victory? How could that possibly not be a victory? And how would you know what could happen? If you had that success right after 30 days, who's to say what would happen in 90? Yeah. Who's to say that it wouldn't be completely – what if you can't cut it in 50 percent? Every 30 days, that's possible and that's worth it because if you study the long-term implications, the long-term complications of ignoring type 1 diabetes, if you study the dangers of all the drugs that those diabetics are on, and I've done video series on this for those who want to go look at the real research of the dangers of insulin, of the dangers of metformin, of the dangers of all these other drugs, if you really understood those dangers – you drop all your stories and excuses. You'd pick up the phone, call an expert, and get busy working on it tomorrow because we could reduce your insulin, your blood sugar, and your H A HbA1c and all that stuff. We could correct all of those numbers in such a short period of time. It's ridiculous. And so every other story about, well, you didn't introduce me to 103 people well, is bullshit. You're hiding. Um, and to make excuses to say, well, a lot of children have type 1 diabetes – and it is very difficult to get them to completely comply with the program. We can make improvements with them. It has been difficult to get them to comply. Another adult personal friend of mine who has type 1 diabetes, he came to me and said, listen, here's the real deal. Honest. Lots of respect for him. He said, uh, I've had it since I was like two. Uh, and uh, I actually listened to what you said, and I believe it can be done, and I am going to do it. I am going to set aside some kind of at least 30-day period to to really evaluate how I can do it. I'm going to run the tests and measure and all that stuff. He said, but I'm going to save up my money, and, and I've got to be mentally prepared for when I'm going to buckle down on the discipline. And I've had two adult friends tell me that, and at least I can respect that level of honesty oh, yeah. instead of – instead of the rest of the games and the charades about it can't be done. No. It's been done. It was that, controlled in a clinical research setting and 50% of type 1 diabetics in 72 hours. What was what was that film? Do you know? The oh, the, oh, oh, that was a different one. That was Raw for 30 Days. Raw for th oh, is that Raw for 30 Days? Yeah. Um, because this is the thing, as you just said, look, if people just think, look, I do believe it can be done, but I'm just not disciplined enough at the moment. I've got a lot going on. I can't do it. Um, you'd be like, cool. When you're ready, school. when I went through my own health problems, for, for, for I was going, kind of, I would have done fucking anything to do it, yeah? And so, when I finally found the guy that helped me get through them, um, I stuck to the plan to the letter. And I did it for about eight months to maybe ten months. And everything went, my cysts went, my skin cleared, I dropped weight, I felt fantastic, my candida disappeared, I had, uh, like, everything was, literally, I was a different person eight months than when I started, and just everything changed, and I would have done anything to do it. Um, that's the problem. It's, it's the fact that they're going to have to stop living the life they're living, going out and having food with mates eating wrong stuff or having a beer with their friends or whatever it is. It does take stepping away from life like you normally are to, to, to do it. And you need a healing period. Afterwards, look, you get yourself healthy and you want to go and do that, that you put things in place where you can go and maybe have a beer with friends later on or whatever. But you need to do the work first. You need to give your body time to respond. Otherwise, you're just going to keep on digging a hole, digging a hole, digging a hole, and you're getting deeper and deeper and deeper, and it becomes harder and harder to climb out. And this is the problem. I've got another friend who, who we've got um, who plays on the same team as us. He's had type, two, type 1 diabetes forever. And, and he runs marathons. He does a lot of running marathons, but he's still massively, you know, being kind to him, he's still got a lot of weight that he carries. You know, he's, he's out of shape. Even though he, does, and he goes on the football pitch and he can't be as quick around the pitch as other people, but he can keep on running. But it doesn't actually lose any weight. I mean, it might keep him in more shape if he didn't do it, but it doesn't help his diabetes. He's doing it because he's saying you know, he needs to keep fit for diabetes. And I'm like, 
there's a million and one other things you should be doing first before going out and running marathons 26 miles. How about we get you internally healthy first, you know? How about we do you 90 sure. days of you eating this way and maybe doing exercise that isn't going to put so much stress in your system, which isn't going to mean that you're... Because people don't realize the body is not just... It's not just nutrition. It's an emotional, spiritual, mental entity. The metaphysical is huge. And so... You've got to have, you've got to give your body the, the right environment to be to heal, as well as the right nutrition to heal, right? If you're eating the best mm. food in the world and drinking the cleanest water, but your life is so stressful and you hate your job, that is no condition for health, right? As you probably know, mm. if you do with cancer people yourself, you've got to be in a place that you can actually heal. And fair enough, you know, you've got to give yourself time to do that. And I think that's hugely important as well is, Look, just be honest that if you can't do it right now, it's fair enough, but don't sit here and tell us that it can't be done because it can, same as anything else, because your body didn't have it before and it won't, and it won't have it afterwards. you just got to give yourself time to go through it. And um, at the end of the day, you give it a go and it doesn't work. Just just, just play devil's advocate. What's the worst that can happen? Oh, no, I've become <laughs> far healthier. I've lost a lot of, lot of my um, subcutaneous fat. Um, and and I just, my head's, I've got rid of my brain fog, my skin's clear. It's just like, there's a million one things. And also, you're going to reverse the type 1 diabetes on the quiet. But, you know, it's just going to be a different world to it. So, it, this is the thing. From, from So, so... I want to get into with food choices as well, just for diabetes. Just, just for example, you know, and as you said, getting the better food in there, and obviously beta cells help to regenerate the pancreas. What are certain things that people c- can do? What are things that help um, reverse the like, heal the beta cells, and what are, what are things people can take to help heal the pancreas? What are what are people? What are just for example, even if I weren't having them in my everyday diet, what are some pancreatic um, healing foods or energetic foods you can have? Yeah, well, step one for most people, just cutting out, cutting out all the unnatural foods that don't belong in the damn system. I mean, you, you, you know, I get the idea that it sucks. It sucks royally to discipline all the time. No one wants to say no to going out for beer and wings with the guys and eating all the other deep fried pub food and all that stuff. Do you think anyone really wants to say no to that? I mean, there are some people who may just not like those things, but fill in the blank for their version of the equivalent. They don't want to say no to those things, but some. Sometimes you just need to hit the pause button and you need to do it. So if you're going to eat all – if you're going to eat the list of all the common food allergens on the planet, okay, so if you're going to eat, eat all the common food allergens and expect no problems, your pancreas being a, a digestive organ largely, you're going to ex- expect no problems. That's ridiculous. You're going to eat, you're going to eat anything that's going to sit in your stomach and have a hard time digesting. That's that's ridiculous. So the, the grains, the dairy, the animal flesh, the, all this stuff just needs to go. And by the way, the last thing on the planet you should be avoiding with type 1 or two, type 2 diabetes, of course, is fruit. You know, when I fix people's blood sugar control things, you think I'm running from fruit? No, 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 no. We fix it with lots this. of fruit. Yeah, we fix it this. with fruit. You know, we fix it with lots of fruit. Of course, that's how it's done. You know, I'm not running from fruit. Never. The, the foods that are good for you when you're sick are the foods that are good for you when you're healthy. And that never changes. It never changes. There's no circumstance where that changes. You know, people are like, are you kidding me? I got all this type one and I got it. And you're telling me I can eat fruit. Watch me, <laughs> you know, watch me. And any, 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 and it, we're going right back to another point now. Suppose someone says, no, you don't understand. I'm extraordinarily sensitive to eating fruit. My blood sugar does X, Y, Z. And it goes, great. okay, what other imbalance is going on? That's causing that problem. What other, you know, I talked to this type one diabetic in a forum. Someone tagged me on a talk to her and she turns out she's a medical doctor and she's singing the praises of, and she's so disciplined. And I kept asking her, then where, where would you get, where did you get your diabetes? You got it in your thirties and you're perfectly healthy. You're a medical doctor. You're an expert on health. Her great, great grandmother gave it to her who never had diabetes and there was no diabetes in her family history whatsoever. And I was proposing that fruits and vegetables are still the health foods for humans. Guess when that's changing? And she's like, no, 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 but you don't understand. She's going on about this long litany of all these things she eats and why it's so healthy. Completely wrong. How is that working for you was my question. And of course, it wasn't working for her whatsoever. 
And she's like, well, tell me the deal. I, I am trying to tell you some of the deal, and you're not listening. <laughs> and then she just going on and on. I was all like, whenever you're really serious and you want it to be a thing of the past, you'll make an appointment, the same answer you would have given any other person asking you relentlessly for health advice. Make an appointment when you're serious. It's not going to be a big deal. You're a medical doctor. You have a big income. The truth is you're hiding. You don't want to change, and you don't want to get better, and you're making every excuse under the sun. This is pretty obvious. And, of course, crickets follow after those conversations. You don't hear anything else. Tumbleweed rolls through the room, You're just like they do in the old movies. People don't want to change. The health foods that were good for humans in every stage of life, they're good when you're healthy. They're good when you're sick. And this is the same way, by the way, that same study where they were controlling the blood sugar of diabetics, uh, you know, in 72 hours, they weren't avoiding fruit either. <laughs> and they got them off of all the drugs. Yeah. So everything you're being told about diabetes from the nutritionist, from the dietitian, from the diabetes specialist, from the doctors, those are all coming from people who have no clue what they're talking about, literally zero. You can listen to them for the next 12 years, and I will produce more results for you in the next 12 hours than you got from them in 12 years. And I don't care how many of them you go visit. Period. End of story. And you can go and test and measure all you want. I'll back up the claims with any test that you would like. Go fund the test. Do it before and after, and we'll test anything that you'd like. The results will be there. Yeah. So when it comes to, to eating healthy, the number one lesson for the average person is just cut out all the garbage. And you know you're not supposed to be eating and get rid of all these justifications. Well, now that I got type 1 diabetes, you see – I have to eat all of these things. I need to get my protein from somewhere. I need to get my fat from somewhere. I need to get my calorie intake from somewhere. I'm not going to eat rabbit food, and I'm not allowed to eat fruit. But, by the way, when my blood sugar spikes, it's okay to – or when my blood sugar has a problem, it's okay to get a candy bar for my blood sugar spike. Oh, please. You know, the, the things that type 1 diabetics are doing and justifying and claiming that that's okay. In the meantime, they're avoiding fruit, but Hershey bars are no problems in their purse. Cut the shit. Know, what could yeah. be more dishonest? Oh, what could be more intellectually dishonest than that? brilliant. The best one as well is that I've got people, even on a football pitch, so they're drinking Lucas Day and they're going, oh, I need it for my blood sugar. Um, I've got my blood sugar's down. I'm like, do you, do you know that that's got aspartame in it, yeah? Not even sugar. What? I'm like, you know it's not your sugar in it. Well, what's that mean? I'm like, Exactly. You're, 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 you've just been brainwashed so much, you don't even know what you're doing. And you're thinking a chocolate bar that is just full of crap. Like it's, it's not even just the sugar, it's, I mean, where's that the chocolate? What's it been sprayed with? What, what ingredients you got? They're all low end. It's just fillers, buying it lots. It's just rubbish. You think that's going to be the same as a papaya or an organic banana, <laughs> you know? Or like blueberries or strawberries or, or raspberries or name it, mango. And one of the things I love about when you go on holidays, when you go out to the to the buffet in some of these places, I'm in mean, Thailand or in Ontario, you've got different fruits you can try. It's, it's gorgeous. It's brilliant for digestion. Yeah. I'm just thinking like, I just don't understand these people. It's just, it's just mind-boggling when people think, because my dad's got diabetes. Well, I say he's got, he hasn't got it anymore, but he likes to be really cautious because we reversed it in about four weeks because he was one of these old school guys and I talk about him sometimes and always lean, always lean his whole life, got away with murder, was working away, he was just one of these people with a modern lifestyle, worked hard his whole life, brilliant at what he did, phenomenal, but he'd go away and he'd be having bread rolls, he'd probably have a chocolate bar, a cup of tea, whatever, um, and did it four or five days a week and eventually he caught up with him and he got diabetes and he was on the thing and I said, Dad, listen to me, we'll sort it out. Four weeks later, bang, it's done. But he's always really cautious, like, he just doesn't want to play double advocate. So basically, at 70 years old, he's eating, like the health he's ever eaten in his life looks the best, he's like brilliant. Um, but he's always like, right, what about this fruit? I'm like, Dad, your body absorbs fruit completely differently to what it does with fine sugar. Don't worry about it. And this is one of the things yeah. I wanted to talk to you about. I said, it's a whole food, it's not a tree. How bad can it be? Be common sense. Don't worry about all this the Latin they use in medical jargon, etc. You don't have to have a medical um, a medical degree to know about health. Trust me. I deal with doctors on a daily basis. Trust me, I deal with all the people that the medical industry have failed, and so does Terry, for example. They're all the medical failures that come to us, and they're like, oh, I've been to all consultants and specialists, didn't do anything, but you've helped me in, in more time. Like the guy the other day, in 20 years, I've been, I've had diabetes for 20 years, you've helped me more in one day than I have in 20 years. Well, no, no, so it must be a fluke, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. And um, so I said to him, like, don't worry, these, these are natural foods. Your body can absorb them, it utilizes them, it wants them, they're there for a reason. Obviously, don't go to town and have 20 bananas. I mean, there probably is one guy in the world that can deal with that, but you know, you, when you eat those food, you say when it comes to it, it's talking about it from my doctor's friends the other day because he was talking about how his girlfriend, who used to like 
be like really skeptical with everything I'm saying. Now he's got a girlfriend who's into all natural health, and he's like, Brian, mate, uh, it's so weird. I'm talking about all these things, and he was, he was talking about people get addicted to food. And I said, Andy, never get addicted to things like sweet. You never hear someone going, "Oh my god, I just couldn't stop eating that sweet potato the other day," or as in like I had twenty sweet potatoes, uh, or or bits of steak. It's all these foods that have been programmed by the scientists with a bliss factor, with a salty and sweet and the sugar that you just can't. Once you pop, you can't stop. For example, keep on eating them. So I said to my dad, like, just remember, this is a food from from a tree. It's a fruit. It's there in nature. It's there to make you healthy. But also, if you're really that worried, all you do, Dad, is you have that fruit and you maybe have a little bit of coconut oil with it or something like that. So you're going to slow the absorption rate down of that sugar. And that's something I think we want to talk about, ask you about. How important is combining the foods for these people? So even if they're going to have something that might be, say, high in sugar or, oh my God, I can't have white potatoes anymore because because um, they're going to rate the high in um, a glycemic index. Well, if you're having potatoes... And you also, I know you don't, but if you also absorb them with chicken, for example, or, or I don't know, avocado, and you had a salad with that, and on that salad you had olive oil, or you had some coconut oil, all of a sudden you've completely slowed the absorption rate of that food down, and that makes a big difference. Would you agree? Yes, you can slow down the rate of absorption for sure by various different strategies of food combinations, but... Um you know, really, in my experience with diabetes, it's not necessary. People can eat kilograms of it if they're doing it properly. Right. Okay. Again, this this boils down to, you know, I, you know, Tony Robbins was the master of this. Tony Robbins always talked about the power of distinctions versus generalizations. You know, he used to have this great example where he was training for – it was like a jujitsu – second degree black belt or something and he would fly literally like once a week or once a month for a lesson from some guy out in russia or whatever and he would go and he was dealing with the master and week after week after week after week he had tony doing the same things and tony was so frustrated he's all like does this guy have alzheimer's or dementia does he not remember that we already did this shit like i've done this thing a hundred times and the master was uh, like tony and tony lost it on him eventually and the master's like no no, 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 Tony. I told you to do this and you're doing this. He's like, no, no, I'm doing this. He's like, no, no, no. You think you're doing this, but you're doing this. And they kept going on and on how the master was saying, no, everything was about distinctions, not generalizations. You think you're kind of doing this, but you're only way kind of sort of, you're not even close. He said, if you get it just right as a master, and then Tony would watch this guy who was, you know, I think he was in his eighties who thought he was senile and had dementia and Alzheimer's. And then he would, six guys would attack him. And Tony's like, okay, you go and do the same thing. And of course he failed miserably. He's like, oh, I thought you were the master of it. I thought you already knew all the distinctions. And he said, well, how were you able to do that? Because I did it exactly like this and you thought you were doing this and I did it exactly like this. And again, over and over, Tony talks about these things, lessons in mastery. And that's what everyone can read on a blog. Fruits and vegetables are good for you. Oh, sure. OK, good. So a lot of people assume that that means they know all there is to know about health just because they read that one blog that one day that said fruits and vegetables are good for humans. That's the difference between working with distinctions. You know, whether whether we agree uh, on on the way you are approaching or not, whether that was the exact way or the only way, you are correct. And that's knowledge that most average people wouldn't have, and that's why they hire experts. You know, the idea that you could slow and control absorption rates of things is very real. Does the average person understand that? No. Um, so, of course, that's all about hiring, uh, hiring experts and working with them to figure out, you know, lot, all the distinctions. And people say to me, well, I am doing what you told me. And I'm like, well, show me your breakfast thing. Oh, my God, that's so far from what we talked about. <laughs> How did you arrive at the conclusion that you were doing it? And any time I get people to track and measure what they're doing, it's like, oh, my God, you are so far off from where we ought to be. And that's where continual guidance and more and more. And honestly, some of these people, I feel like I told them 10 times. That's not being an insult to them, but distinctions matter. And maybe they're hearing things in generalization tones, whereas they're not realizing how important those distinctions are. You know, we, we look at these diabetes and these cancer associations. What do they do? They're doing cupcakes for cancer, ca cakes for cancer, chocolate bars for cancer. They don't care about health. Yeah, they're not paying any attention to health. They have no idea. They're, and then you're supposed to be afraid of fruit. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. come on, the insanity. And we take a look at aspartame and all these artificial sweeteners and all these other chemical lab-made addictive substances. These people who are telling me they can't eat fruit when they have diabetes, if I ask them enough questions, if I put a hidden camera in their house, 
they're eating these things that have triple the insulin response of fruit dust. You know, they're eating all these artificial sweeteners and these things. There's a triple the insulin response. Food that came from nature, whole food, plant-based sources especially, like there, there's no such thing as those being bad for you. I love your addictive quality substance uh, comment. You know, sure, you can be addicted to healthy foods, but you're never going to overeat them. Yeah. Your body's got all the satisfaction measures for them. You might overeat a little where you're a little full for, you know, an hour and then it goes back down and everything's just fine and normal. Versus when you're eating the wrong foods, you can feel like shit for 12 hours. You know, <laughs> you could be sick for days sometimes okay. if you overdo it. Yeah, no, 100%. You know? What I was going to say as well with that is it's like – I mean, my roast, if I have a roast dinner on a Sunday, whatever it is, I do love some roast potatoes and I'll generally order more. Um, I say, I have another portion of roast potatoes. It's one of the things I enjoy most. Um, uh, the vegetables and the potatoes. I mean, and I, I might have seven potatoes, you know, but I'm having it with cabbage and carrots and whatever else I'm having. Sour, so you put some raw sauerkraut, whatever else is in there. Phenomenal. But um, I, afterwards, I'm really full. I'm not like, Oh well, I could just keep on eating that. It, your body goes, that's enough. And sometimes I'm eating a bit more because I know I'm just, I'm just, really, I'm just enjoying it. But sure. that's enough. I'm not enjoying it to the point of I'm gonna have another twenty. With your chocolate bars and Chris, it's something called the bliss factor. But when people realise it's why these people go on these eating contests and they're eating like, um, so they have to eat ice cream or, or hot dog or whatever it is. They eat like ten hot dogs and they're full. Then because they want to eat more, they then have some ice cream or something which is pushed them to a sweet or from a salty. So the body goes, oh, actually, now I can eat some more salty foods. And they'll continue to eat the hot dog. And people don't realize this, that these foods have been made by, by scientists in the lab to get you to eat more and more and more of them and to crave them. There was a, I was actually in a, um, in a Thai restaurant um, a couple of years ago. And they had this calamari in there. I know you may not, not agree with calamari or, or whatever, but they had some calamari in there. And um, it was phenomenal. It, had, it was done with lots of herbs and it had like, it was, it was brilliant. And I, and I was in there and I was thinking, I could just keep on eating this. And I said to the guy, what is on this? Has this got MSG on it? And he said, no, 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 it's not got MSG. I said, are you sure? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's not MSG. I said, what about the sauce? I said, what is this sauce got in it? He's like, oh, yeah, the, the oyster sauce, that might have MSG. I said, you can go and check. And sure enough, it had MSG in it. I was thinking, this is what they do. I could have gone back there every day for a week and ate that calamari, and ever since I've never eaten it again. Um, and this was with, this isn't like a good restaurant as well. And um, I was just like, people don't understand. This is and it's the same with you. Uh, the things they're putting in their mouth, lots of sauces, etc. They have lots of things in it. So you got to be careful when you eat out. And generally, I really do try and vet it and try and eat. But obviously, um, my body, I'm lucky. Uh, my body's quite sensitive, and I could tell that something wasn't right there. Um, but a lot of people can't because they're so dead, they're vibrationally dead, the palate's dead. But yeah. it's what people need to under, understand. Um, and what you're saying, they've been also been brainwashed into thinking breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, breakfast has got to be some sort of cereal. Lunch is probably a sandwich and dinner's whatever. But yeah. I don't know if you do for your guys. It's just, just eat real food, right? That's the biggest rule for sure. We go into a lot of distinctions with them. But, of course, eating real food is the number one thing. Like – Am I – should we be eating 20 potatoes? I don't know. Anyone could debate that. But am I afraid of potatoes? No. That's a real whole food. I mean at least it's a real whole food. Okay. It's a plant-based whole food. Is it a perfect food? No. I, I could make the case for that where it's not perfect. But am I scared of potatoes? No. You know, and I love that you – just a little aside when you talk about making food addictive. There are ways if you study food science to show you how much science goes into making you addicted to foods. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can do it with healthy foods also. I, I can make a food at home without using chemical-based stuff to make it extremely addictive. Does that mean everything I make is like that? No. But I can make some things like that. By using science because I've been a student of food science. Imagine the people that work in a lab 24-7 being a student of food science and using chemistry to get you there because it's an easier shortcut. Oh, they can, they can stuff things so unhealthy for you. And the people are really addicted and then they wonder why they're not healing. But they're eating that and saying, I, my, my dietician told me to watch out for fruit. <laughs> my dietician told me to watch out for fruit. Oh, oh, I'm having a blood sugar problem. Get me a Mars bar. What kind? How can you say that in the same sentence with a straight face? It's fucking mind-boggling. Yeah, like, come yeah. on. Yeah. But they do it. They all do it. Yeah, I always say that to my friends. Like, oh, I've got to keep a chocolate bar with me. I'm like, well, what about an apple or a banana? Or, you know, what about, you know, a million and one other things that nature gave you? Why a chocolate bar? Why? It's man-made. 
You know, that's that's a treat for people that can deal with them occasionally. Unfortunately, you're you're not at that stage, so you sure. you can't have that treat. You're not you don't. And this is the thing. Um, even I mean, I don't know, but intermittent fasting with diabetes, and that can be different. But they've even found like people that intermittent fast, it can have great effects on their blood sugar levels, even yep. for diabetics. Um, people because you got to keep you got to eat every every few hours. Well, not everyone. They've had phenomenal results. Studies have shown with it. Um, so for you, if you had type one diabetes, just going back, if you had type one diabetes, Terry, what would be obviously work with a professional, work with someone who knows what you do. I mean, in fact, I've got a yeah. list of things here that you look through and we and then go through things that I do. And basically, it's the what's what of the natural health world. What you should do with any disease, basically, disease, as you say, a lot of it, a yeah, lot of it, a lot of it. But if you had it, what would be the things? If you had type one diabetes, what would you do? Oh, the first thing I would do is call an expert and learn how to eat properly because not eating properly is the number one factor that got you there. Vaccines contribute. Living far from the equator contributes. Dairy consumption. Oh, back to eating again. You know, there's a lot of these risk factors, but eating is still the number one reason. Your pancreas is a digestive organ. You've put too much stress on it and you don't know how to take care of it. And if you learn to eat properly and all the proper distinctions that go along with it, instead of fearing the right or the wrong things, you know, if you go on any blog, everyone at type 1 diabetes is telling you to do the ketogenic diet. These people go on and do it for years and no one's getting better. I can control your blood sugar in 72 hours if you can, the nonsense. And he, But here's the number one thing I would tell them. There's hope because if they don't have hope, they're not going to do anything. There's hope, A, that they can go back to zigging and zagging. I call it zigging and zagging because I don't live perfect. I don't want to. I think life would be boring. I'd rather put a gun in my mouth than live perfectly forever all the time. But I do believe that eating healthy regularly, consistently is is absolutely a must for everybody. No one's going to escape that long term. Nobody. <clears throat> so the first thing you need is hope. Like my buddy with type 1 diabetes told me he's not quite ready yet. And I said, you know, what else has been a problem? He said, well, I've got celiac disease. I'm so sensitive to this and that and all these other foods. And I was like, do you know that sensitivity and allergies to foods are a sign of imbalance in the body and that – while those may not be great foods for you and you're probably not supposed to eat them, I can show you how to get back to eating all of them okay. He's like, you're telling me that if I just listen to you for a while, A, I can get off the diabetes drugs and eventually I can have a beer once in a while without dying. And I was like, yes, yes, that is exactly what I'm telling you. Now, of course, I'm going to advocate for organic, small, craft brewed, local, whatever. But yes, I'm saying that you can get back to having a beer someday with your friends and it won't be a problem. And you can get back to eating some of the foods that you currently enjoy that you're fighting to give up. You're going to be able to go back to eating some of them on occasion within reason, so long as you're doing mostly the right things. And if, you, and, and if you're worried that we're lying to you, there's lots of tests you can go and do today and every single week while you're on the program, if you'd like, and you're going to document improvements. You're going to document improvements in, in a variety of different ways. And there's a series of different tests, ones that you've never heard of as a diabetic, that I can send you for to show you this is why you have diabetes. You see this imbalance right here? This is why you have diabetes. You see this one? This is why you have diabetes. And some of them are going to take 90 days to correct. Some of them are going to take 120 days to correct. And some of them are going to be very individualized. And that's why I'm always very cautious about trying to give out textbook advice, cookie cutter advice that will apply to everyone. While all the fundamentals apply to everyone, that never changes. Mm. There are specific things that may be very imbalanced with you as an individual. And you may go out and discipline really hard for 30 days and then get really frustrated because you weren't getting the results and then say, oh, shit, it doesn't work. Terry and Ryan were lying to me. It didn't work. I did all the right things for 30 days. But maybe there's a few things in their health history that we haven't uncovered that if we just balance those out, Everything we were generally teaching would have worked by adding a few distinctions into the generalizations. Yeah. But the good news is, is working, working with experts, you say, here's eight things, whatever that number is, that we can test right now. And when all of these are balanced and you're following all those general health principles and properly, doing them properly, when people say, I tell people, eat more fruit. I had a banana and an apple yesterday. Okay, that, that may qualify if it's more fruit for you, but it doesn't fit the definition for me. And there's a big difference. My point is if we test and measure, there's so many ways that we can say, listen, you're getting better. Not there yet, not off the insulin yet. Look, this test is showing you why you're not there yet. So 
You did incredible for 60 days. You should be proud of yourself. But I can tell based on these tests, you might take 120 days to get there. Yeah. Some people are going to get it done in 30. They will. There's a lot of people listening to this call with type 1 diabetes. It could be completely free of drugs and insulin in 30 days from now. In fact, research has shown some of them can be free of it in 72 hours. And that was doing – those people who were free of it in 72 hours. Here's a message of hope for people. Those who were free of it in 72 hours were doing – like 10% of what I would tell someone with type 1 diabetes to do if discipline and budget were not an issue. So imagine what happens if you did all of those things. Like in that study, they were doing the basics and they got 50% of people off insulin in 72 hours. Yeah. They, went into, they went into the clinic not allowed to take the drugs and they were just monitoring their blood sugar control. And at the end of 72 hours, they were testing at non-diabetic levels with no drugs. So well, don't tell me there's no hope. I mean – you want to wing it, go and wing it. If it works for you in 30, 60, 90 days, I'll be proud of you and I'll be your biggest cheerleader. But if you want to make sure you're doing all the right things and get it done in the quickest, shortest time possible, whatever that time frame will be, it's going to be different for everybody, then you call an expert. And that's really what it boils down to to figure out exactly what you're supposed to be doing well, distinctly. Be yeah, people, I think you can understand, like, Terry's really passionate about this. He's not passionate about it because he's got an agenda and he wants to, like, he hasn't got no agenda. The agenda he's got and what we've got is making you healthy. We wouldn't be sitting here otherwise. We wouldn't be putting the information out there. We're not here to, to hurt you or dupe you. We're just here to, to actually help you. And it's it's one of the things like uh, he's talking about, you know. It, it's You've got to take the responsibility in yourself. We, we're, I mean, and even if you if you employ Terry, uh, for example, he he's gonna you're, he's responsible to you but not for you. You have to do the work. He can point you in the right direction but you have to do the work and that's the thing. But... It is possible. I also wanted to talk about um, some people, though, they love to have these afflictions because it gives them a way out. Oh, I can't do that because of my diabetes. Oh, I can't do that because of my diabetes. It's like it, make, it makes their life easier and it becomes something they can just put, put things out on. Um, and as you said, like you do with your friend, with, I've had it before, oh, I've got all these things. People come to me and they're generally like, I've said before, I've said to you before, it's like you're putting a frog in a blender and they say, Ryan, fix me. And they've got all these things wrong with them. Um, but the thing is, I say, I say to him, once you start to heal some one thing, the rest of your body will start to heal. The body doesn't go, oh no, we've healed this, but you're still going to have this problem. Once you start to live correctly and, and do all the things right, the body will heal, and it heals everywhere because it wants to be healthy. It's why it's why when you abstain from food for 12 hours, your body goes through, uh, through um, autophagy, and it starts to get rid of the dead, diseased, decaying cells and put through the healthy, young, new cells. It's not stupid. It knows what it's doing. It's a really, it's a really clever organism, and, and as you said, like um, uh, about you want to live life. You know, it's a human experience. You want to enjoy it. God, we go out for for drinks, and my friends might be ordering whatever. I always try and get an organic beer, or if I'm having a mixer, I'll have a fever tree, um, maybe a lemonade or a tonic, which hasn't got any sugar in it, but the fever tree actually has real sugar in it, rather than having aspartame. I don't ever want that. And then, I, or I have a tonic. I'll squeeze my own lemon in there. And I'll have maybe like a, a high quality distilled vodka, for example. So there's ways you sure. can go around it and have a high quality drink rather than just blowing the crap out of the gun and a cheap vodka. It's different worlds apart. It's like saying to someone, look, you, I know you're, you, you're a vegan proponent, Terry, but say someone, say if they have a normal milk, if they have raw organic milk, it's different worlds, you know. It's a huge no, difference. Normal milk, raw, 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 raw um, oh, sorry, um, past free range organic meat different world you know grass-fed meat um compared to whatever even like he's talking about organic organic um vegetables for example different world like phosphate pesticides herbicides etc etc so i mean and, and the people always want to see tests yeah tests 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 and even if i can say look here's a million testimonials are oh, where's the test on that um it's like well you show me the one scientific test that proves love go on <laughs> go on, go and find it but have you ever been in love before? Yeah. Well, go and show me a scientific test that proves love. There never has been, there never will be able to prove love. But you try and tell me it doesn't exist. The world revolves around love. Why do you think people go back to shit crazy over, over women or men or whatever? There's no scientific test to prove it, you know? Um, so, this is another thing. So, it's, it's what people need to understand. Like, there is only one truth, and that is do what works. And as you said, you know, you've got ways to do it, and everyone is, everyone's got their. There's the fundamentals, the basics people should do in, but the reason we can't give out blanket advice is because obviously Terry doesn't know everyone's individual um, circumstances and it would be irresponsible to do to do so. But the basics that he said are really important for people to go out and do. But the one I also want to ask you about, Terry, 
is vitamin D. Now, I wonder how much of a role that has on diabetes or type 1 diabetes because um, it, I mean, the sun gets a bad press in the medical world and my God, stay away from the sun. But uh, everyone else knows that the, ca- the, the countries with the highest skin cancer rates have actually got the least sun exposure than the ones that have. And, and the sun's phenomenal for actually getting rid of a whole va- vast amount of cancers. And that doesn't mean going in the sun for three hours and get burnt to a crisp. It just means good, solid sun exposure uh, to the body is good. So I wonder what you reckon with vitamin D in diabetes. Yeah, I mean, uh, vitamin D is is critical. It's huge. There's a reason why all these diseases, and I've done an extensive blog on my website for those who want to go see it. Many doctors and naturopaths have written to me, said it was the best compilation they've seen on it, um, that it's a huge compilation of real research on the sunshine. But whether we're talking about cancer, whether we're talking about diabetes, all of the rates and diagnoses increase the further you move away from the equator. That's not an accident. Type 1 diabetes is frequently diagnosed in months of the year in countries where vitamin D is low. Is that a coincidence? Of course not. Uh, Type 1 diabetes is diagnosed in people that were born in certain months versus not born in certain months. Is vitamin D one of the largest corollaries for why that's happening? Of course it is. It's massive. It's massive. But, you know, if you're going to go talk to a standard doctor about vitamin D, he has no clue what he's talking about, doesn't even know what an optimal level looks like, doesn't know how you're supposed to replenish it. They don't even give you the right vitamin D in the hospital. Um, 99% of uh, health experts aren't even recommending the right vitamin D. Even the naturopathic doctors aren't recommending proper source of it. So, um, but is vitamin D critical? Huge. You'll go and find someone in, in Jamaica with type 1 diabetes. You're going to struggle to find that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a huge factor. But can people say, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to do that vitamin D thing. I'm only going to do that vitamin D no. thing. I'm not giving up my, I'm not giving up my cheeseburgers. I'm not giving up my, good luck with that. That's not going to work. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. good luck. No. But vitamin D, massive. And I like what you said about is there a huge difference for organic? Yeah, there's a massive difference. Do you think a biodynamic wine is going to be the same thing as the wines in Central Valley, California that are sprayed with helicopters on a weekly basis? Oh, there's a, there's a, there's a night and day difference. Um, is wine versus a lot of other spirits with funny dyes and funny colors or Bud Light full of high fructose corn syrup and genetically modified ingredients? Also, is there going to be a difference between those two things? One came from grapes fermented with wild yeast, whereas nothing was sprayed on it, versus a vat full of rotting substances, waste products from other industries and high fructose corn syrup and genetically modified garbage. You're not just going to go eat Bud, drink Bud Light and call it the same thing. They're wildly universal versus apart mm-hmm. yeah universes apart but Bud Light is one of the other ones what's the other one there's a few that cause light I never I never drink that I always look for a German beer if you're in Europe German in Germany that the, the laws are strict they can't put any rubbish in their beer so it's always yeah. top quality and um, always look for organic craft if I can because it's just it's just these are the things these are the one percent so oh, doesn't matter. some people that they want to throw the baby out the bathwater they go oh I've had a mistake so I'll just do anything wrong well I'm the complete opposite I'm like well no, I'm going to maybe have a beer, but I'm going to do it as best I can. And then sure. afterwards, I'm going to have the water and I'm going to take whatever I need to take supplement-wise or whatever to help my gut, and etc. So you add all these things up, guys, all the little 1%. So we talk about the health ladder. You keep taking little steps up the health ladder. And maybe you do have a, have a drink or whatever and you take some money out of your bank account, but you put some back in by having your probiotics or you go and have a whole food, vitamin C, and then you have lemon water and you help your, your milk thistle for your liver, etc., etc. All these things that you can do. Um, but, you know, you just got to be smart with it. And it said vitamin D, these aren't magic bullets. You've got to do them together. And this is the reason why I talk about it with one of my coaches. Like, I don't mind giving out, I can't give out specific advice, and I can tell you because you don't know you and your situation, but I don't mind giving out a lot of advice. And why Terry puts out loads of content as well because we know these days people aren't paying for information. We're in the world, we're in the age of information. There was more more articles uh, in 2014 than one year alone than there was ever before in the history of the planet uh, the world wow. uh, and th- we're now in 2018 and I'm guessing it's happening more and more every single year you know so we're, we don't mind giving out information because we know that if you're going to come to us you're not paying for information you're paying for the process and the structure but the main thing you're paying for is implementation because you know that we're going to give you the way to do it and you're going to have to do it and it's and it's actually investing that that's why I don't mind giving out uh, information because in the day as you said it's, it's getting to do it and um, when you give people stuff for free generally they don't do it 
Uh, and so it's just, uh, they definitely don't. Yeah, I get, I, I, I get, when I first created a weight loss program, I, I was looking for testimonials and I wanted to help some friends. I gave it to 10 people who had lifetime weight loss struggles, gave it to them for free. Zero out of 10 listened to it, even though people are losing small people weekly by following my program. It works like crazy. People keep the weight off. Losing 20, a guy yesterday, 25 pounds in just over a month. It's not that it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. All these people are struggling with weight could have did it. They don't value it for free. It's not legal for health professionals to to give out uh, specific advice to individuals without a health history. Yeah. I don't I don't need the money. I'm pa- we do fine financially. I'm passionate about the subject, but I actually strongly dislike working with people in general anyway, unless they're really serious. Tire kickers are just annoying. They make every health professional want to commit suicide. Every naturopath I know is looking for a way to retire and get out of it because of the, the way people are you know, seeing things. So it's not like I don't need to work with someone who isn't serious. If you're really serious, listen, the small pittance that Ryan or any health professional is asking for you is a drop in the bucket. It's the price of one dinner out. You know, like if that, that's a, It's a non-issue. The point is we want to know specifically an individualized approach about what is going on with you and help you in the absolute best way possible and give you every last distinction we can instead of just generalized advice because yeah. generalized advice usually with five bucks can almost get you a Starbucks. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's distinctions a, can get you exactly what you're needing to do. 100%. That's even why I think like I put my prices up to work with me as well because I was like, I just don't want to, I want to make sure people are actually interested and will actually do the work. You give them things and so, and so it, wasn't, it was just like, you know, if you give things, people people just take 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 advantage. They don't do it, and so make sure they do it. As you say, and also the stuff that you're teaching them, Terry, whatever it costs, um, it's not just for the program. It's for life. You're teaching these people how to live healthy for life. For life. So exactly. So you break it down. It's uh, the, the it's what one of the fam- famous thing Paul Check says. He even says billionaires come to him or whatever, and. And they and, he, and they say he says well you got organic and they're like organic food oh my god you know how expensive that is and he's like you've got a hundred and forty thousand pounds sports car outside yeah here's your knife and fork go and eat that you know what I mean because you know they're not gonna bury that with you when you go when you go and people don't understand what's actually important so guys if you think about learn a lot of a lot of information here Terry anything else you want to add on type one diabetes anything else you know you think would be valuable for them to know you can do it. There's no way on the planet you're the only special person with type 1 diabetes that can't heal it. There's not a chance on the planet of that. You're worth it. And like Ryan said, proper distinctions carry you on for a lifetime. We're trying dare you to write a list of why you're not worth an investment of 10 cents a day for the rest of your life because that's all – you're just putting it up front. But it's 10 – we're talking like 10 cents a day to invest in yourself to get it all handled and figured out. Whatever the price ends up being, it's pennies a day for the rest of your life to live with the proper healthful distinctions. And you can still zig and zag later. In fact, your body won't punish you as much when you do if you first get healthy. And that's all we're saying. There's hope for you to live a good life. Not You don't have to be a disciplined monk for forever. You just need to be a disciplined monk for a while to get it handled and then eventually you can still live healthy and zig and zag and you can do it why not you why not now and with that ryan thank you so much for having me once again I'm, i love doing calls with you anytime you want to do it we'll set it up again awesome so just stay there a second guys that's episode 49 any questions terry www.terrytillard.com um uh yeah terrytillard.com and also the article i think he's talking about there was a sunscreen not sunshine causes cancer proof it was on july 25th 2016 have a look at that i always talk about that got some great articles um on that as well so read terry's one i know it's going to have everything you need to know and uh, he's got loads of other great um articles on his site as well as program etc so terry thank you very much just hold on there and um episode 49 guys as always stay happy stay healthy and i'll speak to you soon so guys that was terry tillard um, and that was how to reverse your type 1 diabetes. Now, as I said before, I know this is quite controversial, um, but, you know, sometimes the truth often is, um, especially when people have been pilled alive for so long. I think it was Alf <laughs> Hitler who said, if you tell life long enough, people believe it's the truth. And this is, happened, this is very true in so many of today. Well, it's, 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 this is so true in a lot of today's world, especially when it comes to, to health and conditions, you know. Um, so take everything we said there and, and then go and do your own research into it, you know. Um, and as I said before the show, 
before you do anything, do consult your doctor or work with, with a health professional. Um, this isn't a, uh, me, us telling you just to stop taking medication, etc. It's just us telling you um, what we would do or, or the research and then you can go and you can find your own people to work with or um, go about it in the ways you feel best. Okay, But that was episode 49. Uh, I'm sure you can have lots of questions or maybe comments around it. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of love, and I'm sure, as I said before, we're going to get a lot of hate. <laughs> People turn turn us with moronic, and that the pancreas, um, it, it, it can't be restored, etc. Well, um, I beg to differ. Uh, anyway, that was today's show. Uh, please let me know, as I said before, turn over to, to iTunes and give us a review, or share it, like, comment it with anyone you know. Uh, who you feel might need this information uh, I always have fun with Terry and we're definitely getting back on the show uh, and as always guys head on over to www.reviveyourself.co for any information and we've got if you're if you're looking for uh, we've obviously got the free four day mini course there but if you're looking for some more, more individual help then you can get in contact with myself there and we can have a chat about your health issues and how we can help you with them um, all of our programs are very individualised so it will be, we'll be able to help you with whatever you're going through Otherwise, guys, that's it for this week. Next week, I'm talking to, I think it's Dr. Um, Patel, all about medical marijuana. Uh, so that should be a fun show. Um, otherwise, guys, as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and we'll speak to you soon. If you're struggling with gut issues, such as gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, indigestion, heartburn, and want to finally be able to eat the foods you love without the crippling after effects, then don't forget to head over to reviveyourself.co and pick up your free copy of The Healing Health Paradigm today. 